You're listening to the Geekscape Network. Time to fire up the VCR. This one's my favorite. Welcome to Analog Jones and the Tempo Film. I'm Steve. I'm Matt. And we're a VHS podcast that looks at the box art trailer and behind the scenes. And this week we're going into number three in the franchise review of Lethal Weapon. So Matt, uh, what did we watch? Lethal Weapon 3. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm thinking we should cut the blue wire. Hey, wait! What? That's not what I'm thinking. What, do you think maybe the red? No, no. I'm, I'm thinking that it's eight minutes and 42 seconds. We can go upstairs, wait for the bomb squad, and have a cappuccino. I'm cutting the red wire, okay? Help! Oh. What? A minute ago, you said blue. Oh. <laughs> Nearly a catastrophe, huh? I'm cutting the wire. <laughs> See? All done. Rog. They are back. Lethal Weapon 3. Hey, Hubie. Hey, we're looking for a friend of you. His name's Travis. I've never heard of him. Never heard of him. Wrong answer, wrong answer. Wait, right. wait, I'll leave my car here and I'll come with you. No, you're not coming with us. Yes, I am. All right, I'll take my car then. No, you're yes, not. Yes, I am. I can't believe you did that. I got a spare in the trunk. I'll fix you. Tell my partners. I can't believe they did that. You have the right to remain silent. Freeze, please. I want you to see something, Rod. She has a gift. Watch this. Are you okay, honey? I just uh, freeze. Uh, Oh, he raises five of them, man. Yeah, I know. My girl. I never made it with another sergeant before. Shut up, Riggs. Hello, car 54, where are you? The only thing they do contribute is mayhem and chaos. No, I'm chaos and he's mayhem. You have the right to remain unconscious. Anything you say ain't gonna be much. Back to bed. Back to bed. I uh, I do I love the simple titles. Actually, I'm glad we don't have Lethal Weapon colon Riggs or <laughs> you know Lethal Weapon colon Loose Cannon or something like that. I like that it's just Lethal Weapon three from 1992. Yeah, and you get that awkward like it's the third Lethal Weapon. What's it called? <laughs> 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 yeah, the 1992 third Lethal Weapon. We're uh, three years removed from the last one, which I incorrectly said in the last episode that the first three were only two years apart. This one's a three year apart, so that was my bad. Correction, correction corner. Um, but yeah, we mo- moved on to 1992 for the first 90s Lethal Weapon, and boy, does it feel like it. Yeah, May 15th. This has got the. Almost, I'd say June and July are like the big boys, you know, time to get out. But May's right behind it, you know. Star Wars May's is kind kick of, off. Yeah, yeah, usually kick off to summer movies. Yeah, so on a budget of $35 million, So it's definitely, each movie has increased its budget. Uh, that will not stop in this entire series, I can tell you that. Uh, and then this one, you know, coming out, we'll play our little game. Can you tell me how much money this made? Uh, here are the movies that came out around it. Batman Returns, Alien 3, Basic Instinct, Far Away, and Encino Man. Worldwide, what was the gross off this from $35 million budget? I'm going to still... So last time I think it was 250 for two. I'm going to still say lower. I'm going to say 150 for this one. 
Uh, that's somewhere around there is the actual domestic, but worldwide, this thing made three hundred twenty-one million point three hundred twenty-one point seven million dollars. Wow! I just keep underselling these ones. <laughs> well, this one I keep was, thinking lower. This one was a wild success. Yeah, and it's funny because you listed all those movies from nineteen ninety-two. I mean, not like far and away in Encino Man, but like Better Returns was huge in 92 so it's like crazy to think that this was also another runaway success in a very big summer to begin with yeah this is definitely something that i never saw in the theater way too young. well i wouldn't say i was too young i just not interested and we never rented this in fact i think this is both a first time watch for both of us yeah i think we mentioned it in the last episode but of the four movies this was the only one that I had never seen weirdly either. And you were in the same boat. Uh, somehow we skipped this one and went to four when it came out. But this, yeah, this one we had both never seen. So it was, it was interesting after coming off of one and two. And I'm so familiar with one. I've seen it so many times. And then two I'm pretty familiar with. And then really just going in totally blind to this one. It was kind of fun. Yeah, I didn't even watch the trailer to it. I just like went in, popped the tape in. Well, actually, I watched it on HBO Max because I'm a cheater. Yeah, I popped the tape in for this one, uh, but the, there's a there's a little bit at the beginning that didn't work. So <laughs> you you were better off watching it on HBO anyway. I guess <laughs> this one had a, a scrambly point at one point early on in the movie. The tape fixed itself though, and the rest of it played. But I did I did get nervous. I was like, uh oh, am I gonna have to watch this on HBO? Because <laughs> uh, I had never seen it, so I didn't know if this tape I had worked. But yeah, it's uh, definitely uh, fun to go into and, and, and being from like a time period that we often talk about. And I hold I hold so reverent the early 90s. It was fun to kind of go in blind to it. I, I didn't read the description. I didn't watch the trailer. I just was like, I like the other two. Let's go. <laughs> Talking about the tape of this one, you know, we've got two of them. The release from 92. Actually, we might have more. We don't know. The release in 92 and then the release in 98 when it's a director's cut. And I guarantee you, both of us don't know the difference between the original and the director's cut. Yeah, I may have even watched the director's cut because uh, for whatever reason, my VHS slip is from 92. But my VHS is clearly from at least past 97 because it has a trailer from 97 in it so i uh, i don't know what happened here and i don't know if i watched the director's cut or not i, have, I literally have no idea <laughs> I just I, I i don't know what happened here with that but uh uh that's the funny thing about getting these tapes i guess you never know this is kind of an interesting movie too uh pre-production before we get into the tape here is like it was listen to the story of the writer here so the writer Jeffrey Bohm was hired to write a script. He wrote one script. They didn't like it. He wrote a second script. They're like, this isn't working out. And they fired him. Which is then, funny because he wrote two. Yeah. And then they brought in Robert Mark Kamen. And both of these writers, by the way, have really good careers. Prolific. Uh, yeah. yeah. You've seen their names on a ton of stuff. Yeah. So it's it's not like they brought in some amateur chumps. I mean, these are these are you know, big players in Hollywood, especially at this time, but definitely at the end of their career. So he was brought in to rewrite it. Then he was fired. And then they brought back Jeffrey Baum to finish it. And it like had this really weird, like way they had to credit his writings, you know, like he wrote the script and then it was rewritten. And then he rewrote the rewritten script it's very funny because I've very rarely ever seen this, but on the VHS, it says screenplay by Jeffrey Bohm and Jeffrey Bohm and Robert Mark Kamen. I've never seen the same person kind of credited twice under the screenplay by thing uh, like this. So it is definitely a weird case for sure. I've never seen it either. I mean, this is you'd never see a writer that's fired and then brought back to finish his script. But but, you know, like this is basically a Frankenstein together script. And man, I, one of them, I saw that like Riggs actually hooks up with Rihanna Rogers daughter, which I'm like, no, thank God you didn't do that. Uh, that would have been, it's, it's almost uh, more, yeah, it's way more fun to have uh Murtaugh think <laughs> that Riggs is going to do it, you know, <laughs> but then yeah. he never does. Right. Yeah. I it's mean, way that's a funny, funny joke. Yeah. 
I, I don't even get why you've been, I, I don't know, maybe the writer was just bored. But if I would have saw that too, I'd have been like, uh, I don't think you get the whole point of this franchise, even though you wrote the second one, which some people think is just as good as the first one. I don't know, very odd. I mean, he helped write the second one. I think Shane Black, you know, kind of like gave an outline, but we never actually confirmed that. Anyway, let's uh, let's go on to this tape because there's also an interesting story about the poster that came out. So why don't you describe it if we're walking down on a Friday night? What do we got? Mel Gibson, Danny Glover, and in a little like squiggly kind of font, Joe Pesci, like almost like a signed font, like he wrote his own name in there. And we get Mel Gibson standing with a gun, looking intense on the left and Danny Glover on the right. At least the people are lined up with the names, which doesn't often happen with these covers. Um, and then Danny Glover on the right standing doing the same. And Joe Pesci kind of peeking out over their shoulders with his icy blonde hair that he dyed in this movie. And then it just says Lethal Weapon 3 underneath it. Yeah, this kind of just represents like my, like how the movie is. It's kind of stale and goofy at the same time. Because, you know, we've seen this. This is the third time where you basically just plop them on front. The first two, they had them in squares. But now... You know, they're just standing there, and then we got Joey Pesci behind them. Um, Interesting story behind this. Uh, They had a mechanical poster, a stand-up poster, 3D stand-up poster that came out with this movie. And so this was kind of like a cool thing, like, on concept. Like, I saw this in a story one time where it's just like, you know, one of the cool advertisements of movies and concept that didn't work in reality. And they would have Joe Pesci, like, going up above their shoulders and then going back down like he was popping up you know, down, but they had an engine in that, that basically just kept malfunctioning. And a lot of these had to be sent back to Warner brothers. Cause they're like, it doesn't work. Or they just, you know, like propped Joe Pesci's head above them, duct taped it up and just kept it that way and turned off the motor. That's hilarious. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Like in concept, it sounds awesome, but then yeah, in like reality, pop up and, yeah, <laughs> I just, the technology wasn't there yet for it. <laughs> Well, they're probably just trying to save some money because that probably costs a lot of money to send all those posters out or three yeah, exactly. stand ups with motors and stuff like that. Fun idea. Just really didn't pan out. And this is the poster that we kind of briefly mentioned in Lethal Weapon 2 that like my theater growing up, the Norwich Theater, shout out to them, uh, had up on their wall forever when I was going. It was Lethal Weapon 3, so it's like I never saw the movie, but every time I went to the movies as a kid, this poster greeted me, <laughs> lining the walls along with the E.T.'s and the Back to the Futures and Jurassic Park. There was Lethal Weapon 3. <laughs> it's a strange poster to have up there, but it did make a ton of money. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it's just the fact that it was such a big movie in the 90s. And that was when I was going to that theater. So Mm -hmm. perhaps that's why they just kept that one around. The big bus shelter size poster of it uh, with this image. That's the exact same on the VHS cover. So uh, there's a warm, familiar feeling I get when I see this. Yeah, why don't you flip it over and uh, tell them what the description is and all these quotes. The best weapon yet from Pat Collins, WWDR-TV. The action is dynamite from Joel Siegel. Uh, Good morning, America. Okay, okay, okay. They're back. Big time. Lethal Weapon 3 is loaded with a full clip of action, laughs, and shoot the works effects. Mel Gibson and Danny Glover return as Riggs and Murtaugh, LA police detectives whose work routine is anything but routine. Joe Pesci also returns as Leo Getz. Anything you need, Leo Getz. And Rene Russo adds a lethal kick as internal affairs investigator Lorna Cole, who loves taking risks as much as Riggs does. Lethal Weapon 3, not just more of everything, the most! Exclamation point. <laughs> That's a weird last line. Not just more of everything, the most? Yeah, and also like when I when I said Lethal Weapon 3 there, it's just sort of an incomplete sentence. It just says like, as much as Riggs does, period. Lethal Weapon 3, period. Not just for I feel like there's a semicolon or a comma wanting to happen there, but it didn't, and it just looks weird. <laughs> I do like it starting out with, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, they're very funny. Like, it, Leo's back for sure. <laughs> I don't get the shoot the works effects. What? Yeah, that's a phrase I'm not familiar with. <laughs> Who wrote this? <laughs> 
Uh, anyway, before we pop this tape in, we want to remind you to go over to iTunes and rate and review us. If you take a snapshot of that and send it to analogjonestof at gmail.com or put it on our Facebook page, you will be eligible. Actually, if you've ever reviewed us on iTunes, you're eligible to win some prizes at the end of August. Or you can go to YouTube and subscribe. Take a snapshot of that. Same thing. Send it to analogjonestof at gmail.com or Facebook page. Do it. Do it, do it, do it. I know it's a pain in the ass, but it's going to be worth it. And we will give you prizes and we will love you forever for it. So do it. Damn straight. Pop this tape in. See our trailers. Now available on video and DVD. We just get one here. We just get a trailer for the 75th anniversary collection. This is what makes me think that this is the tape from 97, 98 here that we just, that's all we get. And it's the, if you're tape heads and you watch a lot of Warner Brothers movies, you know, the one it's the one that's got like Batman and driving Miss Daisy and you know, the Warner Brothers classics mixed with like these movies, like the lethal weapons and stuff like that. All cut in montage, like two minutes long. Heavily features like Twister, things like that. So you've yeah. seen it. <laughs> yeah, because the 75th anniversary of Warner Brothers, I think, was 98. So that's the tape we're looking at here. Yeah, got to be. Well, that's all we got. But then. that's all we get. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it so many times. I know exactly what you're talking about. So let's uh, let's get on to the feature presentation. And now our feature presentation. This is such an interesting start with them like kind of just being bumbling idiots well actually i should say Riggs is just kind of being a complete jackass with this bomb diffuse to try to defusing this bomb you know i mean it's got the funny cat line in it it's not i'm cutting the red wire okay help who oh. what what a minute ago you said blue did i say blue Riggs, you said blue well, i meant red you sure Look, Raj, we can do it your way if you like. My way! I don't have a quiet! I'm sure, okay? You ready? Raj. What? Aren't you gonna miss all this good stuff when you retire? Aren't you gonna miss it a little bit? Huh? <laughs> I'm cutting the wire. Snip. See? Hold on. Raj. Yeah. Grab the cat. I don't know. I just didn't feel like this was their characters. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like maybe this is an evolution or it does kind of feel too like, and maybe this is having the same writer. This feels sort of like the next step after two. You know, this one follows, feel, feels like it follows two more than it does one. Yeah, but, you know, Riggs was like, yeah, let's go get the bad guys in the second one. Let's chase him down. That feels like Riggs running into a bomb not waiting for the bomb disposal unit and then like oops i don't know what i'm doing with this and destroying an entire building just really doesn't feel like his character now if he was trying to stop the guy about to plant the bomb that feels like Riggs. yeah it's it's over the top it's pretty silly it's pretty uh you know i don't know i feel like it's just like now the character of Riggs is more just like daredevil but not necessarily wanting to die like he did in the first one or whatever now he's just like fucking around it feels like yeah i I think that's what i don't like about him like it in this one it just feels like he's fucking around (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah the the whole point of this is so they can be demoted so they can get in their blue suits and we could also hear you know roger all the time being like i got six days to retirement yeah, this whole movie is pretty much predicated on the fact that uh, Murtaugh is going to retire at, at, yeah, at the end of the week. And they basically have one final adventure to go on before he retires. Spoiler, there's another movie. He doesn't retire. Um, but uh, that's basically sort of the, the crux here that we get. Mm-hmm. And so that's his story. And then the other story we get with Riggs is now he's kind of meeting another woman who may be in his life more than, you know, the girl who got blown up in the last movie. <laughs> yeah, and she actually started as a man who is going to be like Riggs's, you know, match. And then I guess when Donner did his rewrites in this, he demanded that she be a woman and a love interest for Riggs because he just thought it was interesting and the other one wasn't. You know, when they when they tend to add 
a love interest character, I usually kind of roll my eyes. I'm like, why do we need to do it that way? Why can't we just have a female character who ne- isn't necessarily a love interest or whatever? But with it again within the confines of this movie, I think they make it work. I don't, I don't find it annoying, and I and I like Mina Russo's character in this. Her character made sense, you know, coming in with four brothers. She just feels like a match for Riggs. I thought that was interesting. And she does a really good job of kind of maintaining Riggs. His character just feels like she can really wrangle him. So I like that part of it. But I'm also glad that they just didn't stick in like there's another badass cop just like him that knows karate. That's not interesting. I don't two rigs in one movie. That's not, you know, exactly. You know, like it's not like something I'm looking to go see. It's like give the rigs. I already have something, you know, to change him or yeah, rein him in or whatever. Yeah. Just adding another one would have been stupid. And then also too, like it again, defending like the love story. It's not overly sappy. It's not super, you know, lovey dovey. It's, you know, it's a love story within a lethal weapon movie. It's still pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's going around kicking ass the entire time. And somehow got her, I mean, they stuck Three Stooges in there. Like, she's playing a Three Stooges video game. Yeah, I don't even, I don't remember video games looking that good in 92 either. <laughs> PC games. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I looked at it and I was like, I don't remember that. But I think that was, I think... It came out in the Super Nintendo. There definitely was a Three Stooges game on the Super Nintendo. That's hilarious. I did not know that. Just plucking everything from pop culture for video games at this time, I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah, so what's your opinion on this new bad guy? So we get a cop, a former cop, that's a bad guy within this. I He's not my favorite. You know, he's not uh, Gary Busey. (laughs) But he's, I think it's kind of an interesting one. This is more of a bad guy's... I like where he's not like sympathetic bad guy, you know, like they like, like to do now for bad guys. He's kind of just a crazy asshole and he's, you know, burying guys in concrete and stuff like that. I, I don't think he's super memorable, but I still liked him. That's kind of my opinion on him. Yeah. I don't think he's memorable at all. I, I really, this is the biggest problem I have this movie while I kind of, agree with you that having just like the bad guy who's bad i mean sometimes that works i like my bad guys with a little bit of reasoning he they kind of tried to give him reasoning like i worked on those years and what did i get you know just like a stupid pension i wanted out and he was like a really mean cop too i just like felt like this bad guy had no flavor i did like that he he had a connection to the captain, therefore getting the captain a little more involved. Like he gets captured within the movie. So it's kind of fun to see him a little bit in action instead of just behind a desk yelling at these guys. So that I thought that was interesting, but yeah, I mean, that kind of ends sort of his story. That's kind of it. Well, and like how he could just like waltz right into the police station investigation, you know, where they're doing the interrogation because this whole movie starts off with this is they get knocked down to, like, you know, street cops. They stop an armored car robbery. The two robbers that were stealing the car, one gets away and one gets arrested. The one that's arrested is eventually killed by the main bad guy, who's an ex-cop. And the other one, he, the ex-cop, kills him in, like, a concrete bath to intimidate, also, a mobster. You know, like, this... I, I forget what the actual... Tyrone, I think his name is, who's like buying the guns and the bullets. I don't know, like something about this. I'm just like, yeah, I, I this doesn't have any life to me. It just happens. Now, Dolores was a little memorable, a little ridiculous. Yeah, that was a fun, weird addition character. But it was nice to see uh, Murtaugh be like the subject of, you know, an obsessive love and not like Riggs, because I feel like that would have been the normal choice to go that way. So it's fun to have Murtaugh be the one. Yeah, I honestly thought she was going to come in at the end and save Murtaugh. Yeah, I would have liked to have seen her show up one more time. They never really kind of paid that off. No, she just comes with the flowers and says, well, you tell that sweet piece of chocolate that Dolores is looking for him. And then they're like, that was it. Yeah, as he's like hiding behind the desk or whatever. <laughs> uh, another like side character in here. What are you, since you asked me earlier about the bad guy, what are your thoughts? on leo in this oh, movie 
He's this is the worst Leo. So in the first one, he had a whole point in the plot. You know, they show up, they've got to protect him. He he's connected to the whole, you know, like South African money laundering. Is that what it was? Mm-hmm. Yeah, money laundering thing. This one he just feels plopped in. Yeah, and this is I agree with you. I I this I guess a spoiler for our talk about four. I like Leo in four, and I like Leo in two. This one, I do feel like he's kind of annoying. And that's the thing I said about two. I was like, normally this character would be annoying, but I don't find him annoying at all in two. This one, I'm like, okay, okay, okay. He's a little annoying. (laughs) Yeah, trying to sell the house, and he starts his own, like, real estate agency. uh, And then before you know it, he's like, oh, yeah, I remember that. This is the type of characters I can't stand, where they just, like, come over someone's shoulder, and they're like, hey, I know the bad guy. I know where he's at. Yeah, but you're not really part of the plot. You're just stuck in there to keep the plot going. And I read that he wasn't in the original script. They wanted him. I don't know if it was, you know, Richard Donner or if the bigwigs and Warner Brothers wanted him back because his name, you know, sells. But it really feels like it. They were patchwork in this right before the movie started to shoot. Yeah, and, and it does. He does feel kind of out of place. Maybe, yeah, like you said, not really attached to the plot very much. And and like I said, I like him a lot more in four. I think he makes a lot more sense in four. But yeah. here, yeah, it doesn't seem to gel fully, I feel like. Well, and I didn't read all those descriptions before I started the third one. But after, because I was just like, wow, he has nothing really much to do in this. Um, and they do stick him in the ice, the hockey rink, and then he gets shot. And, you know, I agree. In the second one, somehow he wasn't annoying. In this one, he was. Yeah, and I I don't, yeah, and I just, that probably is from the fact that they didn't really fully have it planned to have him be in there, because it kind of feels like it, unfortunately. This movie feels so mean-spirited towards him. The second one was too, but they got away with it because he was a criminal that was just, you know, and they're like, ugh, this this guy. This one, they should be friends with him. I don't know if he's going to be sticking around doing them favors and stuff like that. You need to be nicer to him. And I, I don't know. I, I just felt like a lot of it was unmotivated meanness. I agree. I, I think so, too. Even like his character arc doesn't really make sense because he goes from the money launderer to uh, just a real estate in this one. And then in the next one, he's a PI, which actually feels like a real, it makes sense for the character to be yeah. a PI in the next one. But for, yeah, this one to have him be just a real estate guy, it does feel weird. So, I mean, connecting this all together where they're trying to get the cop killer bullets off the street, the guns off the street, this gets really dark and real when Murtal shoots his son's friend, Daryl. And kills him. I mean, he was shooting at him with an Uzi. So, uh, you know, hey, yeah. Yeah, like Riggs said, it was it was him or you. So, <laughs> yeah, it's not so much that. It was just like this one just feel, like the first two are over the top ridiculousness of like heroin and money laundering and these ridiculous bad guys. This one really just felt a little too dark and real for it to have this like flavor of fun. Yeah, it does. Yeah, the, the this one, I mean, all of the movies do kind of have like sort of this currentness and this underlying thing about, you know, police and the streets and guns, drugs, whatever's happening at the time. It fits in that with the series because, you know, the first one covered drugs, the second one covered a lot of things. <laughs> um, uh, this one is particularly, I guess, talking about gangs w- within, you know, within the confines of this uh story i guess you could say Mm -hmm. and yeah having him kill like a character who we know from the previous movies i don't think it was the same actor but like it's a character we because we see the son hanging out with the friends we see you know murtaugh talking to the friends be like go home guys or whatever so like it is it kind of hits different when he's killed because you're like oh i know that character as a kid from the other movies it wasn't doing some for me but I, I did like that they at least brought back that character whether it's the same actor or not to have him dead at least there's a connection to the other films i like that i think the best scene in this entire movie there's like two of them and they're both coming up is one when yeah, you know, when lorna cole and riggs you know are comparing scars i like that i think that scene worked really well it's very jaws 
it's very but also like now with the romantic twist <laughs> I, I like all that and then i really liked when you know roger got drunk in his boat after shooting a child well i don't know if he was a he's not a child child but you know he's like 17 18 years old that's you know you're barely an adult if he was 18 i don't really know it it would be really hard on someone especially because you have the son the same age i loved it and then i love how they actually played it off as a joke at the end we're like we're finishing a case or no lapd we're on a case we're finishing a case of scotch like that whole joke see that felt like lethal weapon like something really heartfelt and emotional happened to him it got a little dark and then they you know turn it around with a little joke and it's them being you know it's their great chemistry together that scene right there felt like what more the movie should have had yeah i think it comes and goes i think also too separating riggs and murtaugh for a large portion of the runtime makes it kind of feel like you kind of miss their banter and things like that like you're talking about like uh, some of their chemistry is kind of gone when most of the movie is them doing their own stories. I mean, they did okay coming back for the final fight here where they go to the, like this unfinished housing community and then burn it all down. And, you know, the bullets come back into play, the armor piercing bullets. We have a random Travis character that shows up and then dies. Uh, Oh, as soon as they're like, Hey, young guy, young rookie guy, you know, you're, you're going to be the next thing or whatever. I'm like, oh, this guy's going to die. <laughs> yeah, they're just using him as a prop to show that, you know, these are cop killer bullets. Right. <laughs> but you have no connection to the kid. You saw him earlier and he's like, hey, I'm a good shot. And Riggs is like, sure, you are, kid. Pat him, you know, pats him on the head, basically. And then he shows up like 40 minutes later. And he's just like, hey, I want to come with you guys when you go to get this uh, cop killer. OK, kid. <laughs> Dead. Yep. <laughs> so so obvious too like uh okay this I, I don't do you think this travis character was in the original script and then like they lost him and then the ne- the writer who came back she's just like i'm sticking this travis kid in here i don't care what we say <laughs> it's i don't know it's such it's just such a trope to you know have the rookie that comes in that dies i don't know it could have been a part of the script it could have been an addition later yeah it could have been something brought back but it's such like a trope for these type of movies to always have this. So whether it was a decision consciously early on or later on, it's just such a thing we see in these movies all the time. <laughs> if I would have wrote it, I would have had him. He would have came by on his off day in a red shirt. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Yeah, because basically that's what he is, <laughs> what he's doing here. He is the, the red shirt set up to die. Yeah, I if I were writing it, I would I would have him live because I feel like that's sort of like the that's turning it a little on its head because we're I think we're almost programmed. Like as soon as they showed this kid, I was like, he's gonna die, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, well, I guess the whole point was also they're like, well, Rene Russo wears two bulletproof vests at the end, and that's why she doesn't die. But what got me is like that bullet went through like a steel canister. And, you know, bulletproof vest. And I'm like, wouldn't that be the same thing? Yeah, I mean, if you have the double on, wouldn't it still go through if it pierces anyway? <laughs> yeah. Eh, script logic maybe didn't work there. Oh, well. Uh, yeah, so you get into this final fight. I, the final fight's cool. I mean, they spent a lot of money. And I really liked that he got in this, like, uh, I don't even know what it was, bulldozer with, <laughs> like, the big teeth on it. And they shoot right through it with the cop killers to kill him. I I mean, that's great. And also a thing that like where Roger is running around with Daryl's gun, his like Uzi gun the entire time. I just thought that was funny because no actor looks more awkward carrying an Uzi <laughs> than our man right here. I mean, he's uh, Danny Glover with that Uzi just looks wrong. Yeah, it does. And in this one, too, it feels like they still are kind of aging him because by the time we get to four, I feel like we're kind of caught up to the age he's supposed to be. So they don't really Danny Glover looks like Danny Glover in four. And this one, he almost looks kind of almost too old for how old he actually is. Uh, Yeah. When you see him running around with an Uzi, it's like, who gave grandpa the Uzi? (laughs) I know. And I'm trying to think he like didn't he just do predator yeah i did predator 2 in 1990 and it's funny how just like he looks in great shape in predator 2 
it's not that he looks in bad shape in this one. He just kind of looks tired. I do. I, yeah, I think they like too, they aged him too much in this one or something because because we talked about it in like the first one's episode. It's like they have him 10 years kind of older than he already is as an actor or whatever in the script. And this one, yeah, it feels like they just really super aged him here or something. And it's like, eh, he's not that old. Like, and yeah, like you said, we saw him two years prior in Predator 2 and he looks fantastic in that. So uh, I think they went a little too hard with the, and it may be because it was the six days before retirement. They really wanted to age him. They really wanted to show that it was the end of his tenure as a cop or whatever. But I almost feel like it's a detriment to the movie. I think they aged him a little too much. Because, yeah, because when you have him running around with an Uzi, it does look silly. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Did you stay for the after credit scene? I did. I always stay. I always watch the credits for these movies uh, just because I, I like to try to catch some of the names of people that went on to do other stuff. Like our boy Yan DeBont, the cinematographer in this yeah. movie. I saw um, yeah, so I like to stay for the credits and stuff, and I'm glad I did because that was that was the only way we got our getting too old for this shit line in this movie. I was oh. like, they didn't do it. They didn't do the line. And then and then we stay for the end, and it's like, oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, I do like how they went to Florida for this one. I think they went to Florida for the first one, too. And this, this second building that comes down was a hotel, and they, like, paid money. They're like, can we have it just look like it's exploding in front of two uh, stunt doubles and they're like sure whatever (laughs) if you're paying for it i thought it was cute it was it was a nice tag you know this is what uh back in our day this is what the post-credit scenes used to be like it wasn't necessarily setting up a sequel it was just kind of a funny little thing after little button on top and uh yeah i thought it was pretty funny and cute when they the building just blows up right away and they're like, we got to get out of here. And they just drive off. <laughs> Let's get out of here before anybody knows we're here. We're never going to hear the end of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it was funny. And yeah, and it's coming off of, like you were saying, the end sequence was really good. The end kind of final battle. And I, I will say too, for this whole series, we're on the third one now. Anytime they set up the set pieces, the action set pieces in all of these movies are great. Oh, yeah. They're spending a lot of money on these. They're not pulling any punches with these sets. They're just they're just really big. They're really nice and they uh, have good action. Yeah. And I think I just think in general, some of the magic that's missing in this one that's in the other ones is, you know, the. It, it does feel like it kind of has some franchise fatigue a little bit by the time you get to this one. How, but like I said, they don't hold back on the action sequences, at least. Now, before we get to our recommendations, uh, I can't believe this because I don't remember this at all. There's an NES and a Super Nintendo game for this. I don't remember the Lethal Weapon 3 game at all. How do you even make a game? I mean, I guess it's ta- it's an action movie, so I guess it's a little bit tailor-made for games. But like, I'm like, how do you make a game off of this? <laughs> I don't know. I assume a side-scrolling, like, shoot em up or driving or something like that you know i don't know i i assume it was another game that a smaller studio did and they're like well let's just plaster these characters in it who cares that's how most of these movie games are made very very few of them are made you know as a movie game on its own at least back in the day yeah because you could just do a blurry pixelated version of a character and be like look it's rigs (laughs) yeah done uh so (laughs) But uh, recommendations for me, uh, I am really low recommendation on this. I think only completists need to see this. I don't, other than, you know, introducing Rene Russo, this film really just doesn't do anything for me in the franchise, and I kind of just don't want to really rewatch it. I'm a little, I, I, I like this one more than you did. I, I did, I, I think I still really enjoyed it. I don't think I enjoyed it as much as one and two. But I, I, having never seen it before, uh, I still had a good time. There, there's still the breeziness to this one that I think the other ones have where you can just pop it in. It's an easy watch. I never was checking the time when I was watching this. I never, you know, got lost, I guess, in it. It was very just simple, straightforward, two hours, action, set pieces, actors and characters I like. For me, I liked it. It does have the franchise fatigue, in my opinion, where it doesn't sort of have the magic that the first two has. But 
I enjoyed it still. I liked it. I would recommend it still if you like the other ones. I don't know if this is the one you need to seek out if you haven't, you know, like if you have, if you really love the first two and that's kind of it. I don't know if you'll love this, but if you like the whole series and you haven't seen this one like us, I liked it enough to say go for it. So I recommend there you go. Get a like, almost no recommend, kind of light recommend to a recommend, regular recommend. Yeah, regular recommend, not a super recommend, but a yeah. regular. <laughs> okay, and before we move on to the museum, let's remind our listeners about the Geekscape Blood Drive. Hi, Geekscapists. The Geekscape Podfather, Jonathan, here. In May, we lost one of our own, longtime Geekscapist Christopher Ellis, who was a friend and a part of our geek community from the very beginning. Chris even met his wife Sarah through our podcast, and their 2015 wedding seemed like a giant Geekscape party. Chris's final weeks battling in the hospital shed light on a huge national problem. The COVID pandemic has almost completely depleted our national and local blood banks. These supplies are used by thousands of hospitals to provide life-saving treatments to patients or to buy enough time for loved ones just to say goodbye. So for the next month and beyond, we're going to do it big in Chris's memory and do some good in the process. We're throwing a blood drive. Visit www.aabb.org to find a donation center near you or visit other blood and platelet donation centers like the Red Cross. And let's make things interesting. For the next month, take a selfie of yourself donating with the hashtag Geekscape Gives and tag your favorite Geekscape podcast. We'll pick some charitable Geekscapists to send prizes to and the podcast that gets mentioned the most will also get some cool rewards. I should actually cancel the podcast that gets mentioned the least. Can I do that? Whatever. The point is, go out there and donate some blood, tag a selfie of yourself doing it with the hashtag Geekscape Gives, and get others to do the same. We couldn't save our friend Chris, but we can do a whole lot of good in his name. Geekscape forever! you go you just take a picture of yourself giving blood you know put your hashtags and your your ads on it and they will give prizes and the podcast with the most amount of uh mentions they get prizes too everyone gets prizes 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 don't say any of us never did anything for you <laughs> um do, do it again it's the easy thing go do it it's a good thing take some pictures tag us in it so we can see it and do do the good do the right thing yeah and i can say if you're in the city i know it can be tough to get an appointment to uh try to get give blood because i've been trying to do that and it's it's tough most of them are during the work days I'm like uh that's not gonna work for me <laughs> do it when you can <laughs> yeah okay let's move on to the museum This is the second time I've had to reclaim my property from you. That belongs in a museum. So do you. This is the part of the show where we go out in the film jungle like Indy and bring something back like Indy. We got to do it. We got to bring something back to our museum. The lethal weapon wing in the museum. What do you got? I'm going to a pleasant surprise in an addition to the series. I have to put Lorna in there. Uh, Rene Russo's character in a typical scenario like this for an action movie. I feel like this character doesn't work. They make it work effortlessly. Maybe it's the script. Maybe it's just Rene Russo's top-notch, you know, ability to carry something like this. I think the character works. I think it's good. I think it pushes the franchise in a more interesting territory, you know, rigs settling down. I like it. I think she's good. I'm glad they added her. I think she's good in the movie. Like that scene you were talking about where they're comparing scars. It works. It works for me. I like it. Good addition. Keep her around. Oh, they do. And they do. <laughs> uh, mine was just Travis sucks. That's my note in the entire thing. I, I just, I can't. That character just felt so damn lazy. Tropes. Tropes, tropes, tropes. <laughs> and like, why did they have, like, I don't know what it is, but he just looked like a reject on the apple pie, you know, like, <laughs> like he was a guy in the background of apple pie. And you're like, ah, oh, you can't be an actor in this, but it's. <laughs> Uh, I don't, or I mean American Pie, I'm sorry. Yeah, he's just like a white boy, good-looking guy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> white bread, good-looking, generic. Yeah, they just picked him off a conveyor belt. Probably thought maybe he'd be a, another big thing. Be like, oh, he's a good-looking guy. Young, hey. actor. Maybe he'll be something. We'll put him in the movie. And then, no. Nothing ever really happened with that guy. <laughs> 
It would have been funny though if he'd have been in a red shirt. I would have yeah. loved it. <laughs> Missed opportunity. Yeah. Maybe next time. Nope, nope. We watch the next one. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe next time, but not the next one. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it is a little too obvious, a little too tropey. Okay, until next week when we come back for the fourth and final installment in this franchise. Remember to be kind. And rewind.